Good afternoon, and welcome to the formal opening of the 2019 academic year at the University of Maryland. I'm Dr. Pamela Lanford, the Director of Animal Research Support and the Administrator of the Institutional Care, Animal Care and Use Committee. It's my privilege this year to serve as Chair of the University Senate for the academic year. In the years that I've spent at Maryland as a faculty member, this university has become, in every sense of the word, a flagship institution, a national academic and research leader. This transformation reflects a concerted effort, campus-wide, by faculty, staff, and administrators. We meet today to recognize their exceptional contributions. To open this convocation, please join me in welcoming Dr. Wallace Lowe, President of the University of Maryland. Thank you, Dr. Lanford, for serving as chair of the University Senate. Thank you for your exceptional leadership of shared governance at the University of Maryland. And to all of you, welcome to the 2019 convocation ceremony when we honor and we celebrate the contributions and the accomplishments of our colleagues on the faculty and the staff for research, teaching, and service. This is a very meaningful uh, ceremony because it reminds us that this institution stands on the shoulders of very, very dedicated colleagues performing the missions of this university that makes this university one of the great flagship universities of the country. We will begin by recognizing distinguished service by our colleagues and to present the President's Distinguished Service Awards, I call on the Vice President for Administration and Finance, Carlo Colella, who is a TERP, a TERP engineer, and he's been here forever. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lowe. The selection process for the President's Distinguished Service Awards begins with a call for nominations by an advisory committee, chaired this year by Professor Jason Geary. The criteria for consideration include exceptional performance, leadership, and extended service that has advanced the quality and goals of the university. It is with great pride that I introduce the 2019 recipients of the University of Maryland President's Distinguished Service Award. The first honoree is Lorraine De Primo. Lorraine, would you please stand? <laughs> For more than 35 years, from her vantage in student affairs, Ms. De Prima has been a campus force for improvement, efficiency, and modernization. Many conveniences we now take for granted began with her, such as the campus travel and procurement cards. She also introduced the use of credit cards in campus retail and expanded Terrapin Express campus-wide. Known by coworkers for her collegiality and coordination skills, she has also earned the affection of the students she works with. Dr. Lowe, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Ms. Lorraine De Prima for the President's Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations, Lorraine. The next honoree is Dr. Francis Duvinage. Would you please stand? <laughs> Quietly, methodically, for 11 years, Dr. Duvinage has revolutionized Maryland undergraduates' pursuit of scholarships and international awards. Through his efforts, some 
1,400 federal and national awards have gone to our students, often leading the nation in areas as diverse as science and foreign language. Dr. Duvinage has achieved this success through encouraging qualified students to apply and guiding them step by step through the process. His success has become our students' success. Dr. Lowe, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Francis Duvinage for the President's Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations. The next honoree is Ms. Dolores Jackson. Ms. Jackson, would you please stand? An Executive Director of Administration for the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Ms. Jackson plays a critical role in its success. A mover and shaker, she outfitted the nine labs in the Edward St. John building on a tight schedule and shepherded work renovating older labs and classrooms. A force for modernization and efficiency, she has generated an elegant molecular structure for the, structure for the department and has taken special care to strengthen the bonds linking faculty, staff, and students, often sponsoring opportunities for growth and development. Dr. Lowe, it gives me great pleasure to present to you Dolores Jackson for the President's Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations to all. The next honoree is Mr. Youssef Jones. Would you please stand? Up? Mr. Jones is the epitome of dedication and service to our community. He lives on campus as part of an after-hours team providing emergency repairs, often volunteering to work overtime to allow colleagues to spend more time with their families. Complex or routine, he approaches the task proactively and with a seriousness that often helps diffuse anger. Now a foreman, he takes special care in training his colleagues. Youssef is the, just the kind of person this award seeks to recognize. Working behind the scenes, he quietly raises the quality of life, contributing to our success. Dr. Lowe, I am extremely proud to present to you Mr. Youssef Jones for the President's Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations, Youssef. The next honoree is Ms. Deborah Russell. Ms. Russell, would you please stand? For 40 years, I think that's almost forever, Ms. Russell has been the kind of team player you want on your side. Now the Director of Human Resources for Athletics, she graduated from Maryland and never left. She extends that same kind of loyalty to her colleagues, carefully fostering a respectful workplace where each of us can thrive. Deborah carries that same dedication into the community as when she ensures that leftover department food goes to a homeless shelter. Dr. Lowe, I'm extremely proud to present to you Ms. Deborah Russell, the President's Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations, Deborah. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> Please join me again in congratulating the, two th congratulating the 2019 President's Distinguished Service Award recipients for their outstanding contributions to the university. Our provost tells me that I'm up next. <laughs> so, uh, oh yes, I need to introduce our provost, Mary Ann Ranking, Senior Vice President and Provost, and she will recognize this year's Distinguished Scholar Teachers, also our Distinguished University Professors, and the current prize winners. Mary Ann. Thank you, Wallace. I, I have to say, um, this is such a wonderful event. I love it. It's my favorite event of the year. I am always so proud and humbled as I read through these bios of these wonderful, wonderful people, staff and faculty alike. Um, I thank you all for being here with us to help celebrate the accomplishments of these amazing people. So we'll start with the Distinguished Scholar Teachers. This program honors outstanding faculty whose work exemplifies the hallmark of a great research university. They're very distinguished teachers, as well as having exceptional achievements in research, scholarship, or the creative or performing arts. I will briefly introduce you to them, as well as to the other award winners following them, but we can't do justice to all their accomplishments in the oral remarks, so I refer you to the details in their bios, um, in the program, and then on their websites and so on, because they really are a group of incredible people, and you'll be proud as I am as, as you read about them. So we're going to go alphabetically, and our first recipient is Sharon Fries Britt. Dr. Fries Britt, would you stand, please? This is a very remarkable woman. As a researcher, Dr. Fries Britt has conducted highly influential work on ways to make the academic environment more inclusive and supportive for underrepresented minority students and faculty, particularly in STEM fields. She is part of a national task force commissioned by the American Institute of Physics to address systemic underrepresentation in that field. She co-authored a compelling case study of conditions at the University of Missouri in 2015 when racial incidents rocked that institution. Her work has garnered more than 2,000 citations. A devoted teacher, Dr. Fries Britt applies lessons from her research to help her students succeed. The Association for the Study of Higher Education has recognized her as, a, as mentor of the year. And as the first African American in the College of Education to rise from assistant to full professor, she stands as a great role model for her junior colleagues. The university is proud to recognize Professor Fries Britt for her exemplary contributions as a scholar and a teacher. Please come forward. Yes. 
salute. Our next distinguished scholar teacher is Dr. George Hurt, who is professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. Dr. Hurt, would you please stand? Dr. Hurt is particularly effective at merging research and teaching. He is an international leader in the measurement of forest and land use changes using satellite imagery. And he approaches teaching as nurturing the next generation of research leaders. His students say that he cares deeply about them and never misses an opportunity to teach. Dr. Hurt serves as research director for NASA's Carbon Monitoring System and co-chairs a World Climate Research Program study on land use changes. He is part of the Department of Energy's Energy Exascale Earth System Modeling Project, a team member of the NASA JEDI mission, and of the UMD-NASA Joint Global Carbon Cycle Center. He's also associate director of research innovation at the Succinct Center, the Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center. His research frequently informs journalists reporting on the growing loss of woodlands and its effect on climate change. And he helps government officials translate scientific results into public policy. Dr. Hurd has more than 18,000 citations of his 100 plus publications. The university is honored to recognize Professor George Hurt for his distinguished contributions as a scholar and teacher. Dr. Hurt. The next distinguished scholar teacher is Daniel Perry Lathrop, professor of physics and geology, and a member of the Institute for Research in Electronics and Applied Physics, among other things. Dr. Lathrop, would you please stand? <laughs> Dr. Lathrop's scientific inquiry and teaching transcend the usual disciplinary boundaries. It's hard to tell whether he's a scientist or an engineer, a geologist or a physicist or something else <laughs> altogether. In addition to being a professor in two departments, Dan is an affiliate in both ECE and mechanical engineering and is a member of actually two research institutes, IREAP and IBST. Um, in 2012, he received the Stanley Corson Award from the American Physical Society for his work on quantum fluids. He is interested in many things, uh, chaos and nonlinear dynamics in general, but especially in the Earth's molten iron core, which contributes to the generation of the Earth's magnetic field, which shields the Earth from the damaging effects of the sun's radiation and among other things makes life on Earth possible. So that's fairly important. <laughs> Geological records show that this magnetic field has reversed polarity a number of times over the geologic past. And when it does, the magnetic field weakens and reduces the shielding, which can lead to damaging effects of radiation and other things. Um, and this, this reversal of polarity and, in fact, the, the generation of the, magnet, the Earth's magnetic field is not well understood. Dan has constructed an amazing device to study this, a stainless steel sphere three meters in diameter, picture this, filled with 12 tons of liquid sodium. The best electroconductor, he tells me, but I also know from my own past life experience that sodium is one of the most flammable things on Earth. So it's also very dangerous uh, and dangerous experiment. 
When it is spun at high speed, it simulates the effect of the Earth's rotation on the molten core of sodium and the generation of a magnetic field in this, this uh, spinning sphere. But in order to work with this huge amount of incredibly flammable material, his lab has also developed the fastest, most effective liquid nitrogen fire suppressant on Earth. <laughs> so very interesting lab, I think. Since joining UMD in 1997, he has mentored nine postdoctoral scholars, 19 PhD students, 10 master's students, and more than 60 undergraduate and high school students. His chairman, Steve Ralston, wrote of him, it is rare and wonderful to find a teacher and mentor as fully engaged and enthusiastic as Professor Lathrop. He provides not only scientific knowledge, but his deep down love of the lab and of learning. The university is proud to honor Professor Lathrop for his exceptional contributions as a scholar and a teacher. Dan. Our next scholar teacher recipient is Dr. Derek Richardson, professor in the Department of Astronomy. Professor Richardson, would you please stand? Dr. Richardson is a theoretical astrophysicist and a leading scholar in the formation of planets, asteroids, and other astral bodies. How is it, you may ask, that Jupiter-like exoplanets, I'm sure you've asked this many times, <laughs> sit far closer to their star than the gas giants in our solar system, like Jupiter and Saturn. So, Dr. Richardson determined that they formed at, a great, at great distances and then migrated closer in. Now, there's probably more to the story than that, but you know, you'll have to talk to him to hear it. Derek has taken a leading role recently in NASA's program to study, study how to save the Earth from, you know, remember that movie, what's his name? Oh, the guy that climbs buildings, I don't know. Bruce the, Willis. Bruce Willis was <laughs> gonna save the world from this asteroid that was gonna collide and send us all to perdition. Well, that's, that's what Derek does. <laughs> <laughs> he is part of the DART mission a project that will cause a small spacecraft to crash into the smaller member of a binary asteroid called Dynamos to gauge the effect of the collision on the, um, the, impact, the path of the asteroid and hopefully, you know, it won't call it, cause it all to shatter and all fall to Earth and squish us all. Dr. Richardson has published more than 100 journal articles including numbers um, in nature and science, generating more than 3,600 citations. But he's an experimenter in the classroom as well, experimenting with, with classroom environments that let the students really get engaged directly with the material, revamping the course sequence for astronomy majors to achieve much greater student success and encourage a more diverse student population. The university is proud to honor Professor Richardson for his exceptional contributions as a scholar and a teacher. Derek. Please join me once again and congratulating these wonderful new scholar teachers. They will all present, so you can go and hear more about this Jupiter deal. Um, it, they're all gonna present a lecture during the course of the year, so watch for that. And, and I'm sure you will be um, really glad you did. They, they're all gonna present wonderful um, summaries, I think, of their research and, and its impact. So once again, please join me in thanking these terrific people.
Now, I am very pleased to recognize another group of faculty members whose distinguished career accomplishments bring extraordinary credit to our campus. In the past 39 years since this award was instituted, only 110 faculty members have been honored as University of Maryland Distinguished University Professors. It is my pleasure to present to you our 2019 Distinguished University Professors. And we have more this year than ever in my history of Provost in a single year. So this is, this is really a wonderful um, feast of achievement, really. So um, our first recipient is Dr. Patricia Alexander, the Jean Milan Professor of Literacy and a distinguished scholar teacher in the Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology. Dr. Alexander, would you please come forward? Okay, let me tell you about, about Dr. Alexander. She earned her PhD at Maryland. <laughs> she is a towering figure in the field of reading and learning, although she's kind of short, but, <laughs> but otherwise she towers. Backed by a very strong body of research, her model of domain learning has created new understanding of the roles of interest and experience in academic learning developed from reading. This is something we're all familiar with in our daily work, I think. The model identifies three stages of learning related to knowledge of the field, level and type of interest, and the ability to acquire and process information from reading, and ultimately to develop real expertise and generate novel ideas. The model helps guide effective approaches to teaching, and Dr. Alexandra has called for teachers to develop tasks in learning environments that support students' engagement in knowledge building by reading with interest, rather than simply information management, which you see an awful lot of today. She often shares her work at national conferences and serves as a journal editor. Her work has been cited more than 21,000 times. As a researcher, teacher, and mentor, Dr. Alexander has had a profound influence on her discipline, her students, and her colleagues. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Alexander the title of Distinguished University Professor. They give us the privilege of making a few remarks, so if you will let me. First of all, I want to thank President Lowe and the Selection Committee for what is truly an exceptional honor. I want to thank my chair, Kelly Mix, my dean, Jennifer Rice, and Associate Dean, Carrie Ann O'Meara, for my nomination. As a former middle school teacher and a first-generation college student, I pursued my doctorate at the University of Maryland in hopes of answering one deceptively simple question. Why do some individuals succeed academically while others struggle and fall farther and farther behind? This is fundamentally the question that guides my research today and that led to the model of domain learning, or the MDL. The MDL seeks to capture the process by which one progresses from being a true novice in a field to being more competent and perhaps to expertise. What the model establishes is that individuals' ability to move toward expertise in any domain is shaped continuously by the breadth and depth of their knowledge, by their ability to function strategically in efficient and effective ways, and by their deep-seated interest in their chosen domain, an interest that fuels their passion and that allows them to persist even in the face 
of the inevitable trials and tribulations. Over the past several decades, the components and premises of the MDL have been upheld in multiple domains, from mechanical engineering to reading, from human immunology to history. However, what I recognize today, as I am named a distinguished university professor, is that there is yet one more factor not accounted for the, in the MDL that is critical to determining who will ultimately become an expert in his or her domain and who does not. Significant others who make the journey possible, bearable, and worthwhile. Yes, you see, what I want to acknowledge today is that no one successfully travels the path to expertise or to become a distinguished scholar, university professor alone. And there are significant others I wish to recognize who have shaped my journey. My parents, who are humble, hardworking people who never attended a college in, in their lives and who never really understood what it meant to be an academic but who never failed to make me feel loved and supported. My mentor at the University of Maryland, the late Ruth Garner, who showed me that it takes what it takes to become a scholar. My son John, who sacrificed so much as the child of a single parent striving to succeed in academia. And his family, my daughter-in-law Karen, who by the way happens to be one of my former students, and who is herself an endowed chair at Penn State. And my two remarkable granddaughters, Lauren and Paige, who simply loved me for being Gaga. That's Gaga. And I was Gaga before Gaga. OK. Um, <laughs> the other significant group who have contributed so much to my success is my academic family, my current and former students, and my adopted students, my beloved colleagues, and my collaborators, several of whom are here with me today. Without their inquisitiveness, their intellect, their industry, and their insights, and without their abiding care and emotional support, I would not be receiving this honor today. To you all, I say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Dr. Sean Carroll, professor in the Department of Biology, would you please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Carroll came to the University of Maryland very recently in 2018 as a distinguished biologist, teacher, and public advocate for science. His colleagues describe him as one of the pioneers of contemporary evolutionary developmental biology. Sean studies the evolution of physical diversity in animals. He has shown that it often stems from the regulation of, of common genes rather than from major changes to the genes themselves. He seeks to understand the relative contributions of different genetic mechanisms, such as gene co-option, gene duplication and loss, and regulatory and protein sequence changes in the evolution and control of genetic material, in the patterning of complex structures and the evolution of novelty. Recently, his team has been investigating um, we were a little worried about this when he came because we thought we might have to have them in the lab, but investigating the genetic regulation of biochemical novelties such as the origin and evolution of rattlesnake venom toxins, or snake venom toxins. Maybe it's more than just rattlesnake. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway. that with the animal authorities. Yeah. <laughs> right. Sean has been highly honored for his work he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has uh, mentored 60 undergraduates at least, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, but his influence extends well beyond his own students or even the academy. 
He is a master communicator of science. He has produced or appeared in more than a dozen feature and documentary films, extending the public's understanding of science in wonderfully creative and entertaining ways. He heads the educational arm of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and in that role has been leading a major effort there to incentivize the improvement of STEM education in U.S. universities. But in addition, he has also led a major effort to defend and support the teaching and understanding of evolution in our nation's schools and in public science venues across the country. He is a true hero of science. Dr. Carroll, we are deeply proud to have you as a member of our campus community and honored to bestow on you the title of Distinguished University Professor. Well, thank you very much, Mary Ann, and thank you to the university. Um, I misread the instructions, so they I thought it said one to two hours of remarks, so <laughs> it's going to be a little while. Now, can you imagine this, they ask professors for one to two minutes, that's like, you've all been in a classroom. That's not even throat clearing time, right, for, for a professor, but that's good, good discipline. Um, thanks so much, because it means a lot coming from my new community, so I thank all the people uh, both in my department and in the college and the university who supported this nomination. Um, I'll get around to whether or not I'll actually ever earn it. Um, it's really important to underscore, and I think Patricia before me uh, highlighted a really important thing when anyone gets honored. Um, and this is especially true in science, that individual honors are almost always misleading. Um, and that's because it, it almost always takes a team of people uh, over a long period of time to make the discoveries, and that's abundantly true in my case. Um, so I just wanted to use this happy occasion uh, to acknowledge and thank all of the people uh, who have contributed to the body of the work that's being recognized today. And uh, my success, or our success, is really the result of my good fortune to be able to coach um, just tremendously creative and very hardworking people um, at the University of Wisconsin before this and now at the University of Maryland here in College Park. Um, some of these folks were members of my team for more than 20 years, uh, which uh, provides a certain amount of continuity that uh, scientists are uh, extremely rare to experience. Um, and about 40 of them now lead their own research streams ac across the world. So I'm incredibly proud of what we accomplished together. I'm even more proud of what they've accomplished as independent scientists and um, I'm forever grateful for their ideas, their discoveries, and the key secret ingredient to a successful lab, which is a great sense of humor. Uh, I know it may be hard for you to believe that scientists actually have a sense of humor, but um, uh, my little anecdotal studies over several decades is um, the better and more successful ones uh, do, or they have some other pathology that gets them through. So. Um, but we're not done. I'm, I'm speaking of the past, uh, the quest to explore the unknown. There's so much to discover about the world and about the universe. And um, that thirst for discovery, it's what drives science and scientists. So um, as Marianne mentioned, I moved to the University of Maryland just a bit over a year ago. Uh, but I came here to open uh, new vistas. So uh, I hope that in the coming years, I and my team will, will do something to actually earn this honor. Thank you very much. Our next recipient is Dr. Albert Pete Kyle, professor in the Department of Finance. Professor Kyle could not be with us today, but I'll tell you just a little about him anyway in his absence. He's a profoundly influential economist, responsible for seminal work in the field of market microstructure. 
Often called the Kyle model, his work analyzes pricing in financial markets, particularly when some of the participants have special or insider knowledge. His 1985 paper on the subject has more than 10,000 Google Scholar citations and has had practical applications for policymakers for decades. More recently, Pete has developed insights into smooth trading amid market microstructure invariance. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but. Uh, Dr. Kyle came to Maryland in 2006, and when markets collapsed into the 2008 crisis, his expertise was in high demand. He counseled the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice, among others. He will receive his plaque upon his return to the campus. Our next recipient, Dr. Francis Lee, professor in the Department of Government and Politics, um, would you please come forward? Dr. Lee is a foremost scholar of American political institutions. These are such relevant people here we're reading about. She's just amazing. She has made the, the most of our proximity to the nation's capital because she researches the dynamics that have gradually immobilized Congress. Her 2009 book, Beyond Ideology, was the first academic work to define the role of partisanship in the US Senate voting behavior. It has been cited over 400 times. An award-winning writer, her seminal textbook on Congress is hugely popular on US campuses. And she edits also the Cambridge Element Series in American Politics and the Chicago Studies in American Politics and recently co-edited can America govern itself? A very good question. This summer, the Library of Congress appointed her its inaugural chair in congressional policymaking, an opportunity for her to research legislative bargaining and negotiations. The university is honored to bestow on Professor Lee the title of Distinguished University Professor. I thank President Lowe and the University of Maryland for this wonderful recognition. But even more importantly, I want to thank the university for making it possible for me to receive such an award. Over my 15 years at University of Maryland, I've had all the support I needed or asked for to advance my research. I had excellent graduate student assistants and co-authors in the Department of Government and Politics. I had research funding support from both my department and from the uh, Vsauce under Dean Ball. I also had leave time from sabbaticals as well as the RASA program. My colleagues and students gave me helpful feedback on every project I carried out. My department staff made grant administration go smoothly. Finally, as Marianne mentioned, being a scholar of congressional politics and policymaking, University of Maryland's location so proximate to the nation's capital has been just invaluable to me. So although I am happy and honored to accept this award, I'm also keenly aware that it rests upon contributions and help from so many others here at the university. Dr. Mark Leone, professor in the Department of Anthropology, would you please come forward? In addition to a long career of campus service, Dr. Leone and his students, including Department Chair Paul Shackle, rewrote the history of Maryland, helping 
established the role played by African Americans. He led excavations of the homes of Charles Carroll of Carrollton and William Packa, both signers of the Declaration of Independence. And there he uncovered concealed evidence of African spirit practices performed by enslaved peoples, among the first such finds in North America. Mark's teams excavated two Annapolis homes owned by free blacks before the Civil War that remained in the families into the 20th century. They held evidence of how these families managed a free but often very restricted existence. And through a mix of diplomacy and persistence, Mark and his students spent nearly a decade excavating the boyhood home of Frederick Douglass, the one-time plantation where Douglass said he first came to understand his enslavement. In the process, they confirmed extensive African religious practices at the plantation that Douglas never mentioned in his autobiographies. Fifteen of Mark's graduate students have earned PhDs, and his publications have been cited more than 4,500 times. Taken together, Dr. Leone's innovative body of work speaks to the struggle of African Americans seeking liberty in an Enlightenment-inspired community that idealized liberty in the abstract. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Leone the title of Distinguished University Professor. Thank you all. President Lowe, Provost Rankin, Vika, my daughter, Damien, who's two and a half and putting up with a lot, my grandson, Chris, my niece, Sarah, my sister-in-law, Peggy, an awfully good friend, Paul, Barbara, Michael, and my own wonderful students who have also put up with an awful lot, but who cared to come. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, said he chose Maryland, and he chose to live in Maryland and stay in Maryland because it fulfilled his motto, Any, anywhere so long as there be freedom. There is an irony, to say the very least. As a Catholic, he could not run for public office or worship at the time of the revolution. He fought for a greater degree of freedom, which then got enshrined in the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment. Freedom also remained elusive for the many slaves, the very large number of enslaved peoples who supported his vast, vast estates. He was one of the very richest, if not the very richest man in Maryland. They, too, wanted religious independence. They left behind hidden religious remains that helped me and my students achieve a new understanding of Annapolis and of Maryland's history. Carol's house still stands in Annapolis, and some 40 years ago, Paul Shackle and Barbara Little, who are here, and I excavated throughout the estate and the rooms on the ground floor of the house uncovering what are called spirit bundles. And they are relics, deposits of African religious traditions and practices that have an origin in Africa. And they are used by enslaved African Americans during the late 18th and 19th centuries. And these were, to put it mildly, in all probability put there without the knowledge of the people who owned these people. They hid these religious items so that no one would interfere with their African and Christian beliefs held simultaneously. 
This discovery was one of the first of its kind in North America that was recognized as such. We as a group of people, scholars, went on to find many other examples of these practices in Annapolis and at White House on Maryland's Eastern Shore. In the 18th century, African Americans blended these traditional African beliefs into their early Methodist Episcopal and African Methodist Episcopal churches that flourished here in Maryland throughout the Eastern Shore and well beyond. Our scholarly task remains how to understand how all of this is connected and it is difficult to see. I mention the motto of Charles Carroll and the religious independence he and enslaved people sought to highlight my own affection for our institution and for Maryland as a whole. His motto is in fact, I believe, the University of Maryland's and the state of Maryland's. Despite that piece of thing on the escutcheon which nobody can understand, which is our official motto. I do not believe Carol invented the motto. I believe that Maryland, its people, invented the freedom that Carol gave a name to, just as the enslaved people managed a measure of religious independence when the white world wasn't looking. Their history, Carol's, and our history, which is really one, links Maryland's early quest for freedom to the one that continues today, and I don't have to tell you, is not finished. Finally, I remember my late wife, Nan Wells, with whom I could not have done this work. Dr. Ming Lin, Professor and Chair of the Department of Computer Science and the Institute of Advanced Computer Studies, would you please come forward? <clears throat> Ming Lin is the Elizabeth St Stevenson Ereeb Chair of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland. Her research involves applications in virtual reality, computer graphics, and robotics that are focused on multimodal interaction, physically based animations and simulations, as well as algorithmic robotics and their use in physical and virtual environments. So you'll have to come uh, talk to Ming Wen to understand exactly what that means. But, what is true, I know, is that there are many, many practical applications of her work, and uh, she's highly sought after in many areas of computer science. Ming is known especially for her work on collision detection, and in particular for the Lin Canny algorithm, um, and in collision detection and analysis. And this has a lot of applications, of course, in robotic cars, self-driving cars, and all the kinds of things we hope we come to adopt soon in this traffic-ridden area. Her software libraries implementing these methods are widely used in commercial applications of a variety of kinds, including computer-aided design and in computer games. Um, she uses these techniques um, to inform uh, physically based modeling, haptics, uh, 3D computer graphics, computational geometry, interactive computer simulation, and so on. She did her graduate studies at the University of California, Berkeley, before joining the UNC faculty, University of North Carolina faculty, in 1997. She is currently a member of the IEEE Computer Soci Society Board of Governors, and a member of the Computing Research Association for Women Board of Directors. She was given the IEEE Visualization and Graphics Technical Committee 2010 Virtual Reality Technical Achievement Award Phew. in recognition of her seminal contributions in the area of interactive 
physics-based interaction, and simulation for virtual environments. In 2011, she was listed as a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery for her research in geometric modeling and computer graphics. And she was listed as one of the 2012 IEEE fellows for her contributions to real-time physics-based interaction and simulation for virtual environments, robotics, and haptics. She is a former editor-in-chief of IEEE Transactions on Visualization and Computer Graphics and has served on numerous steering committees and advisory boards of international conferences as well as government and industrial technical advisory committees. Ming has also co-founded a 3D audio startup, startup called Impulsonic, which was recently acquired by Valve Software. She has co-authored or authored or edit, um, edited or co-edited co four books and has authored or co-authored 300 journal articles that have been cited more than 29,000 times. She's an incredibly accomplished researcher, obviously. Um, it's hard to imagine how she has time to also be chairman of a huge, very complicated department like computer science, but she does. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Lin the title of Distinguished University Professor. Thank you, President Lowe. Thank you, uh, Provost Rankin, and also the DUP Selection Committee for this uh, recognition, and also for Dean Varshney for the support and nomination. Uh, for the last couple of decades, my pursuit of physically based and physically inspired multimodal interaction with the virtual world has been deeply influenced by a classical paper, um, Evan Sutherland's vision on the ultimate display. That is to serve as a looking glass into a mathematical wonderland uh, constructed in computer memory to serve as many senses for human user as possible. I have been very, very fortunate to work with some of the most brilliant minds in the pursuit of this vision of ultimate display. And this recognition um, speaks to much about their work as for mine. So I would just like to take a few seconds to thank them here, because uh, really this recognition, it's, it's not just about my work, but um, about the work of my collaborator and most importantly, my students. So I, I do want to first of all thank my former advisor, John Kenny at Berkeley, um, for his support and guidance and for allowing me the flexibility and the freedom to set my own research agenda and, cha and chart my own path. Much of my research um, like most of us in academia, would not be possible without my students, colleagues, and collaborator throughout my career around the world. And I, I just want to thank them, just take a few seconds to thank them and shout out to them. Uh, um, even if they are not all here, but I, I think it would be just nice for me to call out their name. I want to thank John Cohen, Stefan Gocha, Eric Larson, and Chris Panaki for developing the first sets of interactive collision detection that has been widely used in industry around the world. I want to thank Miguel Tadui, Arthur Gregory, for co-developing the first sets of uh, six degree of haptic rendering algorithm, especially Miguel, um, who put up with his advisor and, and co-authored two books with me. I also want to thank Bill Baxter, Vincent Scheib, Jeremy Wendt, for developing the first generation of physics-based virtual pen media that is currently available. Um, on your desktop system, you just didn't know. <laughs> to Nikunj Rank, uh, to Nikunj Raghuvanshi, um, Ziming Rang, Euro Ye, Will Moss for interactive physics based sound synthesis and sound propagation system that are used in millions and millions of copies of game, games being played in, the many, in many living rooms right now. Um, also to Kelly Warren and Susan Fisher for bringing our research on hair simulation into Disney's first anima animated film on hair, Rapunzel, and to also a whole bunch of extremely fun group of 
grad students and postdocs that I have worked with, Stephen Guy, Yor Vandenberg, Shankar Des, Rahul Narang, Abhinav Golas, Jason Sewell, uh, Sachan, and uh, Abnish Su for our joint work on collision avoidance um, algorithm, which uh, Mary, Marian has mentioned, and for bringing them into the future autonomous driving. Um, lastly, I want to say that it takes a village to raise a, a kid. Um, it takes generation of family to get a DUP. Um, I want to thank my husband, Dinesh uh, Manocha, for putting up with me for many, many crazy hours over the years and, uh, um, and for often being the first one to recognize the potential of my work before anyone else. I also want to thank my parents, uh, most of all, for not, for not just encouraging me to pursue what I want to, to do, but also being our portable nanny uh, for many years. They travel with us to help us with our kids, and so I really, really appreciate that. You know, the, the, the love of parents didn't stop when, when you grow up, they, they continue uh, still with me today. Um, and I also want to thank my daughters for um, excusing me from missing their birthday from time to time due to my travel for work. Um, and finally, to thank the funding agency for paying the bill for all these work. Uh, and also the, the startup company as well. Um, I do want to say that I look forward to decades of, of fun research, one of the biggest pleasure being in an academic um, environment, doing research and teaching, is the continuing ability to interact with brilliant minds and young minds and be able to learn from them as much as, as we teach. So um, I, I also want to thank um, University of Maryland College Park for giving me the opportunity to be here, and, and it is also a great honor and great pleasure to be leading the Department of Computer Science here, and hopefully we'll be doing something great in the next couple of decades. Thank you. Dr. K.J. Ray Liu, professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Would you please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Liu's pioneering work in signal processing has solved seemingly impenetrable problems and opened new technological possibilities. Among his international uh, recognition, his research was featured as one of seven technologies that IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization, believes will dramatically change the way humans interact with machines. He has won the University of Maryland's Invention of the Year Prize three times. Dr. Liu solved the problem of indoor positioning and tracking, and he proposed the concept of radio biometrics. He founded an award-winning company delivering wireless AI. He has maintained a high profile in his discipline, serving as editor-in-chief of Signal Processing Magazine and president of the Signal Processing Society. He is a popular speaker, a consultant to industry, of course, and has testified as an expert witness in numerous legal proceedings. His scholarship includes 10 books and more than an incredible 700 journal articles, cited more than 32,000 times. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Liu the title of Distinguished University Professor. First, I would like to thank all the students and colleagues who have, work, who have been working with me in the last 30 years. Without them, I would not be standing here. I also like to thank those who nominate me and wrote me reference letter, 
And most importantly, I'd like to thank my family, especially my wife, Lynn, for their support and love in all these years. If you don't know yet, academic is a long but lonely career. We choose to stay in academia, not because it can enrich us, but because it offers us an opportunity to educate the next generations and make an impact to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Dr. Sally Simpson, professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, would you please come forward? <laughs> Sally is an international leader in the study of corporate and white collar crime. She has brought clarity and rigor to this often ignored field. She developed a comprehensive database and investigated corporate situations that led to criminal activity. She has also studied methods for preventing or controlling white collar, white -collar crime, including corporate self-regulation and legal sanctions. Sally helped found and currently directs the Center for Business, Ethics, Regulation, and Crime, the first venture of its kind to formally link business with criminology in an academic environment. Through CBERC, UMD seeks to scientifically confront, assess, evaluate, and develop best practices at the intersections of business, ethics, regulation, and crime. Dr. Simpson's scholarship also probes gender and crime. She and colleagues are developing a database on imprisoned women and the circumstances surrounding their offenses. Sally's scholarship includes two books, three edited volumes, and 60 articles and book chapters. She has received numerous honors for her work, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National White Collar Crime Center. She is the incoming president of the American Society of Criminology. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Simpson the title of Distinguished University Professor. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, President Lowe. Thank you, Provost Rankin. And thank you to my husband, who is here, and members of the faculty of Criminology and Criminal Justice. As a longtime University of Maryland faculty member, it was with gratitude and humility that I learned of my distinguished university professor title. Frankly, it's an honor that I had never contemplated. But also it is one, as you have learned from others today, that is not earned on one's own. As scholars, we are formed and inspired by the context around us and the people with whom we work. And thus, I am grateful to my home department of criminology and criminal justice, the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, and the campus for the opportunities that have come my way over the course of 30 years. This is particularly true given that my chosen field of study, corporate crime, is not readily amenable to conceptualization, counting, and measurement. And yet, it is in this problematical space where I have labored my entire career for which I have been recognized. So the moral to this story is study what excites you and do what you love. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. 
Dr. Richard Walker, professor in the Department of Geology and chairman of the Department of, Bi of Geology, would you please come forward? <laughs> Dr. Walker is an internationally acclaimed geochemist. His research focuses on the origin and evolution of the solar system and the geological history of our planet. Using geochemical markers, he traces things like the evolution of the Earth's crust and mantle, the origin of our moon, and the chronology and chemical evolution of early solar system materials. These studies include application of short and long-lived chemical chronometers based on radioactive decay and research on isotopic heterogeneities in meteorites and other astral bodies. For example, within the first 150 million years after our solar system formed, a giant body, roughly the size of Mars, struck and merged with the Earth, blasting a huge cloud of rock and debris into space. Um, this cloud would eventually coalesce and form our moon. Dr. Walker and colleagues used uh, ratios of tungsten 182 in the Earth and the Moon and showed uh, and, um, that the... Thank you, it's complicated. That the mass of material <laughs> created by the impact that uh, ultimately coalesced and cooled largely resulted in the formation of our moon. And this was an alternative to a couple of other theories that you can ask him about. This, Richard, Richard said, this result, the moon result, brings us one step closer to understanding the close familial relationship between the Earth and the moon. We still need to work out the details, but it's clear that our early solar system was a very violent place. It's cool. Among the honors Dr. Walker has received are an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship and the Clark Medal from the Geochemical Society. His scholarship includes more than 200 articles in journals, including some in Science and Nature, cited more than 17,500 times. And he, too, has time to be chairman of a department. The university is honored to bestow on Dr. Walker the title of Distinguished University Professor. Okay, well, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this event, including President Lowe and Provost Rankin. I want to thank the people that nominated me for this great honor, and I want to thank the selection committee. So uh, I grew up in Harford County in the northern part of this state, so I'm one of the uh, rarer faculty on this campus that uh, actually grew up in the state of Maryland. In uh, the mid-1970s, when I was looking for a college, uh, my parents strongly encouraged me not to come to the University of Maryland. They were not impressed with its uh, academic reputation at the time, although they probably were underrating it a bit. Nevertheless, I did go out of state for my higher education. Uh, after a few postdocs uh, and applying for lots of jobs, Guess what? It was the University of Maryland that offered me a job in 1990, and I have uh, been here ever since. Uh, when I started working, I can give you a bit of a historical perspective here, since I've been here almost 30 years. Uh, when I got here in 1990, the campus was a bit rough around the edges. Some of you, some very few of you may remember the uh, collapsed chicken coops uh, near the stadium. I never did find out what happened to the chickens in the chicken coop, but uh, the coops uh, did eventually uh, disappear, and uh, the campus is now a really wonderful environment with a number of new buildings. It's a very different campus from what it was in uh, the early 1990s. Um, 
So uh, my uh, arc of 30 years here has seen uh, really tremendous changes, not just in the uh, physical state of the campus, but also in the personnel. Um, I'm uh, delighted to work within a uh, relatively small department, the Department of Geology, that is uh, just filled with wonderful people, the staff, my fellow faculty, my uh, students. Uh, I've been able to work with uh, wonderful postdocs and undergraduate students in my career here, and I'm uh, particularly grateful for that. Uh, overall, I think the arc of the university has been uh, steadily upward. We're now, I think, recognized as one of the world-leading universities, and I hope we can continue onward in that uh, upward trajectory for the next number of decades. Uh, the last thing I want to say is you're probably not listening to me, but instead wondering where I got this cool hat. <laughs> Uh, this is a uh, Finnish graduation hat. It uh, comes with a sword, but I'm not permitted to bring that to campus. So all you get is the hat. Thank you. Please join me in a big round of applause for all the 2019 Distinguished University Professors and their outstanding contributions. Now, I know that our wonderful Dean of the School of Public Health is thinking right now that we need a moment to stand up and stretch before we finish the program. So would everybody, right, Boris, where are you? <laughs> everybody stand up and stretch. <laughs> Sitting is the new smoking, I'm told. <laughs> Excellent. Good, thank you all. Our next, our next awards are the two Kerwin Prizes. And these are just wonderful, wonderful prizes. They were established by the great friends of this university, Britt Kerwin and his late wife, Patricia Harper Kerwin. They were established to honor extraordinary faculty research, scholarly, artistic achievements, and exceptional contributions to enhance the quality of undergraduate education. Unfortunately, Dr. Corwin couldn't be with us today, um, but uh, we will uh, honor him in his absence and thank him for these, these wonderful awards that he and, and and his wonderful wife made possible. The Kerwin Faculty Research and Scholarship Prize recognizes highly significant work completed within the last three years. And this year's recipient is Professor Yu Huang Wang of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Dr. Wang, please stand. Where are you? There you are. This guy does amazing things. Dr. Wang's accomplishments have the power to startle and amaze. In his laboratory, he synthesizes new materials that have never been made before and have exciting new properties. And he does this by harnessing the techniques and tools of nanoscience and nanotechnology, work he describes as both painstaking and creative. He has created carbon nanomaterials for use in bioanalysis, energy storage, and quantum information. The media around the world paid close attention when he recently reported the development of a fabric that warms or cools wearers as needed. The potential commercial applications of this material are enormous. Among Dr. Wang's many honors are a National Science Foundation Career Award in Chemistry, his scholarship includes 121 publications and over 7,400 citations. 
and he has maintained steady research funding from several federal agencies through his whole career. The university and the prize committee take great pride in honoring this estimable body of work. Dr. Wen. This year's Kerwin Undergraduate Education Award recipient is Dr. Scott Roberts, who has served as the Interim Director of the Teaching and Learning Transformation Center and as a faculty member in the Department of Psychology. Professor Roberts, would you please stand? I have to say, this is a special pleasure for me because Scott has taken over the leadership of the Teaching and Learning Transformation Center since Ben Peterson's departure as director there and has done a fabulous job. He's also a wonderful teacher. He imbues his teaching with a special sense of urgency and mission, as he does all his work. He begins his courses by urging students to avoid shortcuts and summon their best, and he gives, he gives them his best. Scott is highly innovative and directs the university's, as I say, Teaching and Learning Transformation Center, but he's also served within that center previously, helping colleagues adapt new technology and challenge traditional assumptions about teaching and learning. As a graduate student at Maryland, he launched a teaching climate survey that influenced undergraduate courses in the psychology department, and this became a model for other disciplines on campus. As a faculty member, he went a step further by redesigning the introductory psychology course and developing an open source textbook, something our students have long clamored for. He also developed a popular one-credit course with the Career Center, The Psychology of Getting Hired, something many people could use. <laughs> Dr. Roberts' continuing energy, creativity, and thoughtfulness stimulates students and inspires colleagues. And today, we recognize this record of accomplishment with the Kerwin Undergraduate Education Award. Scott. Dr. Lowe. So we come to the final award of the 2019 convocation ceremony. And it is my great privilege to present the President's Medal. This medal is different from all the other noteworthy awards that we have given out this afternoon. They're for research, they're for teaching, they're for service. But the President's Medal is only one medal for a person of the University of Maryland community who has made a very substantial impact on the entire missions of the university. It is my great privilege to announce that the 2019 recipient of the President's Medal is the former Vice President for Student Affairs, Linda Clement.
Given that response from the audience, no further comments by me are necessary. But I should say this very, very briefly, because you all know Linda. And uh, she has served here for 45 years, 18 years of them as vice president. You all know that she served in many different capacities. I'll just mention two of them. One for many years was 15, 16 years of, as director of undergraduate admissions. We now have one of the most selective, high quality student bodies in the country. I mean, when you have 38,000 applications for 4,200 freshman positions, that was not the case a generation ago. She began to help make possible the dramatic enhancement of the quality of the undergraduate students at this university. And we simply build upon it year after year. And one of the reasons we've been so successful is because she has helped shrink the psychological size of this university. So when a freshman comes in, they're not one member of a class of 4,000 or so fresh persons, freshmen. They are in small living learning communities joined by common interests, living together, sharing courses together. It is this creation of this living learning community that makes, creates a sense of common unity. I'm one with a small community of 150 to 200 as opposed to I'm a freshman of a class of 4,000. It is these kinds of innovations that have made the University of Maryland what it is. And for that, Linda, for your leadership, I'm very grateful. There's one more thing I want to say. 18 years as Vice President for Student Affairs, and she has left her mark in that division. It's been my privilege to serve as President for nine years. I have learned so much from Linda. And do you know what I think I have learned most of all? I have learned that she has inculcated a certain culture in the Division of Student Affairs, and I've learned from that. And she inculcated it by example. And it is best expressed in the words of the poet and writer Maya Angelou. When she wrote, people forget what you said. People forget what you did, but people never forget how you made them feel. And what Linda has done, she makes the students here feel that they're cared for, that we are very committed to their success, and that kind of feeling that they have, which is one of the reasons why this university attracts so many top students and graduates them, is because that's the culture she has created in the Division of Student Affairs. And for that, Linda, thank you so much, and thank you for teaching me that lesson. Before I turn it to Linda for some final remarks, I just want to make one final comment. As you know, she just stepped down uh, about a couple of weeks ago. But last year, the National Association for Student Professionals, the primary national association of people in the field of student affairs, they awarded Linda the highest honor of that association, the Award of Excellence. They awarded her that because they said in the award that she has helped create one of the finest divisions of student affairs in American higher education. That's what she got it for. And they also noted she is the soul of the University of Maryland. Linda, thank you for your years of service. We shall miss you greatly, but the legacy you live will be here forever.
mess up her hair too. <laughs> and we need to make a photo. Okay, here we go. These hats have so many useful functions, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lowe. I am so very honored to receive this award. And my thanks, too, to the selection committee and to the wonderful staff who put so much thought into my nomination for this award. And thank you sincerely to this university community that has supported and inspired me for over 45 years. And really, it has been 45 years. Since I announced my retirement last February, and people began to realize how long I had been here, so many people have asked me why I chose to stay at this university for over four decades. I've reflected on this question a great deal during the past six months. Barbara Walters, a renowned journalist, offered, once offered a relevant piece of advice. She said, follow your bliss. Decide what you really love to do and that you would do even if you didn't get paid. Well, I have had a career here at the University of Maryland chock full of bliss, and I mean it sincerely. Every day I've worked closely with people in student affairs whom I admire people with engaged minds and very big hearts. I see how their work counseling a student, advising student groups, preparing food or driving a bus, and so many other roles and services contribute to the safety, the well-being, the learning and development that takes place each and every day at this university. I am so grateful to have worked closely with such talented and generous people, and that is why I stayed 45 years. What makes this place even more special is the generosity and ethic of care that extends well beyond the division of student affairs. Relationships in this community are strong and deep, and that's why we are all better equipped to serve our students. It is astonishing to me, truly astonishing, that in my career here, people all across this campus who have I asked for help always pick up their phones, always respond immediately and affirmatively to my requests. I can't name all the hundreds of people who assisted me over the years, but I want to give you an idea of the wide array of people in this network there exists. There are people like Bob Infantino in CMNS, Audrin Ward in Arts, Audrin Downing in Arts and Humanities, Eddie Beatty in Records and Registration, Barbara Gill in Enrollment Management, Jack Baker in Facilities Management, and of course Michelle Eastman in the President's Office. All of these many people have extended themselves beyond what's asked. They give this place heart, and that's why I've stayed for 45 years. One of our graduates, who returns every year to campus to recruit for his company, told me that he recruits our students because they are smart and hardworking. But they also have a characteristic that he doesn't find in other places. He says our students are scrappy. At first, I thought that scrappy meant spirited. But when I went to the dictionary, I found that scrappy means so much more. It means determined and courageous. The more I thought about that, the more I became certain that he was right. Our students are scrappy. They are determined and they are courageous, as is the entire University of Maryland community. The last few years have been challenging on so many fronts, and I know everyone here in this chapel today knows why. And amid all these challenges, people at this university keep coming back digging in, trying harder than ever to make the university the best in the world, demonstrating above all else determination and courage. And for this reason, anybody in their right mind would stay here 45 years. In closing, I offer you an observation that we should revel in the greatness of this community. William Arthur Ward, an American writer, once said, the greatness is not found in possessions, posture, positions, or privilege. It is discovered in goodness, humanity, service, and character. I wish for all of you 45 years of this at this great university. Again, Dr. Lowe, thank you for this award and for the privilege of working with you these past eight years. Thanks also go to my wonderful, beloved husband and life partner, who's really been the greatest life partner I, I could have ever had. I don't know how I chose so wisely at 20 years old. I'm sure some of you in the audience are feeling the same way. I would certainly not have had the career I've had here without the love and support and the wise counsel of my husband, Peter. So thank you all for this award, and I think we should celebrate and appreciate all the goodness that's up here today. Thank you.
I would like, I would like to conclude today's uh, convocation by giving thanks to uh, three times. First, thank you all for being here to celebrate and support these people who have given so much of their lives to this university, and we have recognized them today, so thank you for coming. Secondly, I want to thank Jason uh, Geary, the director of our music school, he and his, uh, the members of the committee. Uh, if they're here, would you please stand up to be recognized? If not, we shall recognize you in absentia. There they are, thank you so much. And thirdly, but certainly not least, I want to thank the members of the University of Maryland Horn Choir. These musicians include Molly Flanagan, Jack Holland, Cosette Rolowicz, Emerson Miller, Christine Stinchy, Al Rice, Emmett Socek, Jeffrey Chapman, and the choir is conducted by Justin Drew. Please join me in a round of applause for them. <laughs> Finally, you are invited to uh, join all of us in the reception. Immediately following convocation, it's in the chapel garden. And the chapel garden is the garden next to the chapel. Correct? <laughs> In which direction? This way, that way? That way. Thank you. And uh, so please stand for the recession as the University of Maryland Horn Choir plays. Mm -hmm. 